Hi, I'm Ash, but you can call me Icon for short. So recently, I've been watching a lot of YouTube videos more than usual. I've been watching so much YouTube that I've exhausted almost every source I have for videos, and I decided to check out a series that a fellow YouTuber, who I will not name, recommended. The series is called Monster Factory, a show produced by the McElroy brothers, Justin and Griffin, where they use the character creation tools in various games to create semi-horrendous characters to roleplay as. The first video of theirs I watched was an episode where they did this in Bloodborne, from Software's popular PS4 exclusive. I watched this first because it was already recommended to me thanks to watching tons of playthroughs and lore-focused videos on FromSoft's games recently. I found the video to be incredibly entertaining in many respects. The character they created, who they dubbed Toucan Dan for his prominent nose and bright red skin tone, was kind of off-putting to look at, and the brothers did a great job of transforming that discomfort into humor. They gave him this odd personality of disliking guns, which are a pretty essential gameplay mechanic in Bloodborne, and played him as a sort of 90s PSA mascot. I clicked onto another video afterward with kind of a bad taste in my mouth for a reason I couldn't quite put my finger on. The next video was about Second Life, a popular VR role-playing game, specifically their revisiting of this world in what they called Second Life, Second Chances. The character they had created for this game previously was a short, stocky man with an asymmetrical face that had a kind of rippled texture to it. I immediately put my finger on where that bad taste in my mouth was coming from after I saw this. The humor in these videos is partially derived from the role-playing of a character with a somewhat absurd, over-the-top personality, but a large portion of the humor was also derived from these characters' appearances. <laughs> oh boy. <laughs> That look, yes. Eyelashes that <laughs> blink independent from the, the eye meat that surrounds them. Do you know how how dis how much disgusts me to say this? Bring back two can dance. <laughs> <laughs> look at that spooky shit. This was what unsettled me, and the reason why is because of the appearance they gave the character in Second Life. Hi guys, welcome to another vlog. Who is so proud of me for vlogging? I am proud of myself. This is Lizzie Velasquez, a disability advocate, motivational speaker, and author. Earlier this year, she was made into part of a trend on the social media app TikTok, where parents would film their children as they showed them fake pictures of who their new teachers would be. Velasquez's photo was used in this trend to inspire reactions of disgust and revulsion from kids, which in turn was played for laughs for those in on the joke. This is not funny. This is not a joke. If mom was showing her son a video of me or picture of me and saying this is your teacher for the new school year and he had a scared reaction on his face. Velasquez's appearance was used as an object of humor and horror and sadly she's far from the only example of this. Disability and disabled bodies have been targets for mockery and objects of horror for a long time. The most popular example of this is from the 1960s, with Alfred Hitchcock's Psycho famously casting a man with dissociative identity disorder as the primary antagonist, an idea iterated on so many times that it's almost considered a horror cliché. Mental illness is an incredibly common theme in horror media, as are artifacts of ableist mental institutions like straitjackets, leather restraints, and padded cells. Ghosts are often understood as being crazed, killers delusional, and monsters driven by some mental defect that compels them to act as they do, often related to some sort of psychosexual disorder or traumatic experience. Whether we're talking about Halloween's Michael Myers, the Silence of the Lambs' Hannibal Lecter, or Leatherface from the Texas Chainsaw Massacre films, horror media broadly portrays mental illness as something to be feared and people with mental illnesses as dangerous or violent. This demonization of the disabled mind is often externalized and made physical to help visually convey such supposed monstrosity to a movie-going audience. The Nightmare on Elm Street franchise has Freddy Krueger as its main antagonist, a perverted, psychotic killer with horrific burns covering his body, a visual marker not just for his difference, but his malignant and cruel nature. His burns are there for a reason. They signal to the audience that he is different and to be feared. Disability is an easy visual shorthand to convey this. A non-normative body can be a visual indication that there is something abnormal about a person's mind as well. 
While sometimes this is a bit on the nose, such as in Don't Breathe, a film whose antagonist is just a blind man, this visual language of non-normative bodies is very pervasive. Many monster designs are a sort of warped version of what are considered normal human bodies, with zombies as a very basic and straightforward example. The examples I'm most familiar with here, as someone who isn't big on horror media, are actually from software's designs for the enemies in their games. Many monsters in their games are explained to be some warped version of humans, contorted by either human action or corruption by a supernatural force. Sometimes this means they become giant half-scorpion people. Sometimes this means they're just very thin and gangly. It's here that I return to Monster Factory and ask a question about this trend in character design. What is this conveying to people? Horror media's obvious message here is that these external deformities are things to be rejected, that we should fear and exclude as they are reflective of some inner flaw. The McElroy brothers, in their series, use disabled bodies as objects of mockery and contempt. A lot of time is spent in their Bloodborne video focusing entirely on how unsightly their custom character is, how disgusting they look, and what sort of reaction they would have to seeing this person in real life. Holy Whoa. shit! The monsters in this game are going to see this man, and they are going to turn tail and run and jump into a fire. And pretend that you are meeting this person in your life for the first time. Okay. And now. Oh, hi there, Daniel. <laughs> like, right? Uh, oh, uh, man. Absolutely very upsetting. The most upsetting part of this guy is that I've been watching you do this for so long that he It started, looks normal. Like, I'm afraid I'm going to go look in the mirror and be like, oh, God, <laughs> yeah. I want to leave the hood on. Because with the hood on, there's still a possibility that he's a normal man under there. Look at this fuck! People are definitely gonna see my shadow and be like, hmm, I'm gonna quit playing Bloodborne for a while, I think. Toucan Dan is not someone to be accepted. He is someone to be mocked, excluded, and shamed. Toucan Dan is perhaps an extreme example, but the character they created in Second Life is much less of a caricature than you might think. And again, their appearance is cause for mockery and rejection. The whole reason I thought to even write this video is because of the Second Life video, because seeing this character used as a punchline reminded me of Velasquez. The message is the same as that of Freddy Krueger, the same one that the TikToks using Velasquez's face reinforce. Disabled bodies are not welcome here. Special Books by Special Kids is a YouTube channel that interviews disabled people of various experiences, and two of their most important videos for me were their interview with a sociopath, which helped challenge a lot of my perceptions of people with stigmatized mental illnesses, and their interview with Zaid. Zaid sustained significant burns across his body when he was young, after a candle fell and caught his blanket on fire. What grabbed my attention was the thumbnail, which is just a frame from the interview of Zaid's face. It piqued my interest, and the first words out of Zaid's mouth broke my heart. When somebody meets you for the first time, what do you hope they think? I hope they think that I'm nice and that I'm not, a, I'm not like a zombie or, or like a horrible creature that's trying to like, hurt people. People like Zaid, like Lizzie Velasquez, and like the many other people who have been interviewed by Special Books by Special Kids, links in the description, aren't monsters. They're normal, complex people whose experience of the world has been made hostile because of a series of conscious decisions made by people who produce media. We have been conditioned to see them as monsters for no other reason than because it's easy. This doesn't mean we should pity them. In fact, we should do exactly the opposite. Their presence needs to be normalized, to be accepted, and their voices need to be heard, because nobody deserves to live a life where everyone they meet thinks of them first as a monster. Before I go, a few things to mention. Firstly, I don't want people to get the impression from this that I think the McElroys are individually bad people. They seem pleasant enough as individuals, but this is about the attitudes their work reinforces, not whether they are good people or not. Behavior can be harmful even if the people who engage in it are genuinely trying to do their best to be good people. Ableism is sadly a topic many people are completely ignorant of, and because the topic is not often broached, these harmful attitudes might never be challenged or confronted. 
I would hope, if this was brought to their attention, they would try to confront these attitudes in themselves and work to become better. But I think it's more important to focus on discussing and combating the attitudes themselves, rather than changing their individual minds. Second, I borrowed some of these ideas from articles I will have linked in the description, and I would highly recommend to people read them. They will be more substantive than this video, since I haven't actually seen most of the media I referenced, I just know the basics through cultural osmosis. For anyone who wants to learn more about disability and ableism, I have two videos covering many aspects of the subject, and you can find a long list of disabled voices and creators in the description to my video, Disability and Introduction. I would encourage you to incorporate these voices into your social media feeds. They are going to be better resources for learning about ableism, disability, and disability rights than any book I could recommend, although I am working to offer some recommendations on that front as well in the future. Lastly, I want to reiterate that people with non-normative bodies are completely normal people, who we have been socially conditioned to view as monstrous, or at least associate with undesirable characteristics, if you'd prefer a softer phrasing. The only response that actually combats this is to platform and uplift their voices, because that's the only way they can be normalized and accepted. I made this video to highlight a problem, but I am actually incapable of solving it by speaking for them or speaking over their voices. Seek them out and uplift them when you can, which includes helping them find their voices and create spaces where they are heard. It's not simply polite or the right thing to do, it's the only actual contribution allies are capable of making. I have some social media links below if you want to follow me on Twitter or catch my occasional Twitch streams, and I have a Patreon if you'd like to support me and the work I try to produce here. Those links are below the resources, because those resources are far more important. Please don't ignore them. Thank you for watching, and I hope you have a good rest of your day.